Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. My guest today is Josh McLean. Josh is the Chief Information Officer of World Fuel Services, a nearly $60 billion revenue energy, commodities, and services company. A native of Australia, Josh moved from that country to the U.S. to take on this role and has driven a remarkable cultural transformation in the process. I look forward to hearing more about his journey and the cultural attributes that he holds most dearly. Josh, welcome to Technovation. It's great to speak with you today. Yeah, thank you for having me, Peter. I'm really humbled and uh, look forward to the time we have ahead. I, I do as well. Thank you so much for saying so. Well, um, Josh, for the past six or eight months, you've been the Chief Information Officer of World Fuel Services, a company you've been with for five years now, roughly. Uh, talk a bit about World Fuel Services for those who may be me listening or watching who, who are less familiar with the company. What, what's the business that you're in? Yeah, World Fuel, it, it's almost um, the company no one's really heard of. So we're a Fortune 100 company at the moment. Uh, head office is in Miami, Florida, um, but we're in 80 locations. We operate in 200 countries uh, globally. So we, we're basically an energy provider um, with our predominant business being in in fossil fuels. Um, we have four main business segments, that being aviation. Uh, we have a, a land-based business. We have a marine-based business. And we have a very much a, a growing um, sustainability business as well. But we are very diverse. Uh, we have everything from, you know, fueling planes and trucks at major airports through to um, de-icing machines, through to developing um, SaaS products for, you know, uh, small um, what we call the T FBOs, so flight-based operators, private planes, essentially, uh, and, and we and credit cards. So a very diverse kind of product offering and and technology suite uh, and a business to match. Fascinating, Josh. I appreciate that overview. And, and your role as chief information officer. Describe that if you would. What, what's within your purview? So under me uh, is all of um, kind of infrastructure, network. Um, uh, cybersecurity is under me and all application development globally for uh, the organization. And you, as as people would uh, realize in hearing your voice, you are not a native to the U.S. Uh, you, you hail from Australia originally. And this was a, a role you took that has first brought you uh, here, at least professionally, um, uh, full time, I should say, being being domiciled uh, here in the U.S. What, what drew you to this opportunity, given the enormous move it meant for you and your family? Yeah, good. I mean, it is pretty obvious I'm not local to Miami, I think, <laughs> with the accent. But uh, yeah, I've been here in Miami. My family and I, I got two young daughters. Uh, we moved, we relocated five years ago, um, but I, I wasn't with the organization prior to that. Um, the connection I had or how I ended up being here was the previous COO in Jeff Smith. Him and I had worked together over many years within Australia. He lived in Australia. He was um, held executive roles in Australia at, at banking and financial institutions where him and I work. So when he started here, we had kept in contact since he left Australia. And when he started here, he, he kind of reached out and said there was an opportunity, would I be interested? And so I didn't, to be honest, I didn't jump at it to begin with. Um, as much as I respect Jeff, there's very few people I would approach my wife to say, hey, let's pack up our stuff and move halfway across the world. Um, but Jeff is one of them. He, you know, he's a very inspirational leader and we think alike. So, but yeah, so that that's how I ended up here was that uh, the decision we went through, my family and I, we, we, we'd often talked about an overseas adventure, as we called it. Um, the kids were young. They were kind of five and, and seven. So they're at an age where they're very um, resilient, right? They're much more resilient than adults. Uh, but we we kind of wanted to, if we're going to make the big move, because it is, it's everywhere is a long way from Australia, but we wanted to go somewhere culturally different to Australia. That was their main criteria. And because of that criteria, the States was never high in our list because the States in Australia are very similar. Um, and I replayed that story to Jeff. Uh, he said, have you been to Miami? Uh, and I said, I hadn't. And he said, well, why don't you come over and check it out? You know, don't um, don't judge a book by its cover type of thing. So I did. I, I came over for a week. Um, and, and I tell this story a bit, but this is what sealed it for me. There was three things I observed and heard when I first came into Miami. So first was landing in the airport and coming off the plane into the airport and, and hearing Latino music blasting through the airport in Miami. I thought this is not normal, right? Is it? And then the second thing was dual Spanish and English signs. So every way, as you go through the airport, uh, if you've been to Miami, everything is dual Spanish and English. 
but the absolute you know the one that sealed it for me was i hopped in an uber to go to my hotel and tried to talk to the uber driver and, and not a word of english so i remember ringing my wife in the uber and said i think we may have found our future destination um and we did five years later and we're loving it we love the diversity uh the ease of travel from here as well we you know we can lots of destinations uh, very close to miami so we have fully embraced that adventure family adventure and we haven't put a time frame on when it will end, but we will enjoy it while while we are uh, while we're making the most of it while we're here. That, that's that's fascinating. What a great story that is. After you got out of the Uber in your hotel, and presumably the next day, you made your way to World Fuel Services. What did you find there? What were your first impressions of the organization that you were being courted to join? Uh, look, Pete. To be honest. I was in- incredibly intimidated. I-, I hadn't worked globally before. I'd been with a big organization in Australia, but Australia is a very small, you know, it's only 28 million people. Uh, Florida has more bigger population than Australia does the whole country. Um, it was a, you know, it was a very prominent Fortune 100 company, a global company. So I was like, I had this high expectation of walking into a very mature well-run operation because of all the accolades it had received. But what I walked into was something very, very uh, different. Just just the people were very um, reserved, incredibly reserved. You could just tell they'd been through a lot of change and it, there was a fatigue about them uh, as well. Um, there was lots of practices they were doing, which was uh, very much of a highlight to me. They were doing very very old legacy, what I call legacy or older practices. Like, for example, there was no kind of automation practices. There was no continuous delivery practices. Even Agile was something that they hadn't really embraced or, or yet alone heard of. And this was 2018. So, like I said, I was incredibly intimidated. But what I found and discovered was something that I was not expecting because of the you know, the profile the organization had. But in replaying that story to, to Jeff when I was there, he said, well, this is exactly why I took the role and why I want you here. We know it's an enormous undertaking. It's a big challenge, but it'll be incredibly fulfilling and rewarding, um, you know, when you look back. So uh, I didn't accept straight away, but I, after debating and going through that, um, you know, personally and professionally, it's been a very good move. And, and given the transformation that was necessary, the things that were apparent, even it sounds like in those first hours uh, uh, in Miami at the headquarters, how did you organize yourself? Um, how did you think about the the sequence of events to help modernize the practices of an organization as large and 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 complex as World Fuel Services is? The the very first thing we did, we knew that with the talent we had at the time and the aspirations we had we needed to fundamentally inject talent who had basically done what we are looking to do to help us we, we knew that the two of us jeff and i were not enough um there was another colleague of mine who came over from australia so the three of us wasn't enough and so what we brought highly talented individuals that we'd worked with before outside and we brought them in, you know, there's nothing better than experience of, of what you're, you know, they've been through what we're looking to go through. So that compression algorithm is only getting better. So that was the first thing we did. We brought people in who we we knew and worked with before, who had, who had gone through similar journeys, but had the collective experience in all different roles. They weren't all leader roles. They were architect roles. They were, you know, kind of testing roles. Um and the beauty for World Fuel, it's not a big IT organization. It's like 400 people. So you, we knew that if we got a kind of a, a key number of folks in those key roles, we could kind of make a tangible difference really quickly because it's not a big scale. Uh, so scale wasn't a problem we really had to solve for. So that was where we deferred um, pretty much to getting the right talent in to begin with. Talk a bit about your own role now, especially as you've advanced to become chief information officer a bit more than half a year ago, the role of a leader in a transformation uh, like this. I know from our past conversations that you've you've done a lot of searching, uh, searching of other leaders, uh, soul searching of your own, uh, to think a bit about um, how one presents as a leader in order to foster the kind of transformation we're, we're, we're discussing here. Yeah, look, I, I'm a big believer in culture is leader-led. Um, as a leader, you know, from prior mentors and coaches, I learned a lot that that you are you are on show where, wherever you're walking, whether you're talking, whatever you're doing. People are looking at you and they're learning from you and the behaviors and what you do and how you do it 
is um, showcasing that culture you want to create. So you're in the spotlight and um, there's a saying a, a, a mentor of mine had was beware the shadow you cast because that shadow casts a long way. And if it's a, a very healthy and good shadow, it'll be well received and well rehearsed. But if it's not, then, you know, the, the opposite will happen. So that's something that that I thrive on, but it, I, you know, it's a big responsibility. But what we needed to do was get that behavior and culture within the leaders that we had here. So there was a number of leaders that we we either brought in or we turned or we spent a lot of time coaching um, because we knew if we got the, the right leaderships in place, then the culture will, will follow as a result of their behaviors. Clearly, uh, the whole notion of culture, it's already come up a, in a couple of different ways, it is near and dear to you, the recognition that that's a force multiplier or, or a hindrance, as the case may be, depending upon the culture that you have. Talk a bit about the cultural elements uh, of the team that you've been building. What are some of the attributes that you hold dearly? And as you thought about some of these uh, people that you brought in who, who were key elements of your leadership team to help turn the organization or nudge it in the right direction, you know, what are some of the, again, cultural attributes that, that, that you believe were especially important in doing so? For me, um, what I learned a lot here, uh, and particularly from Jeff, Jeff, is how do you operationalize culture? Culture is a buzzword. Anyone can say, I don't want to build a high-performing culture. That's all. But but tangibly, what what is that? How do you do it? And how do you go about doing it? Um, and so there's a few things we did here that that um, I hadn't done before, but I we really tried and it's been terribly successful for us. And And one was kind of defining the leadership attributes that were important for us. Uh, and we measured those attributes. So there were six attributes. Those attributes are leadership attributes. It doesn't mean you're in technology. So, for example, there's forming teams, right? How good as a leader do you form teams? Your ability to form teams, you're only as good as the people around you. And so that that ability to form, and that's not just surrounding yourself with people that are high performing. You need to how do you adjust and act on underperformers as well. And that's something a lot of leaders don't do well. And you know, how do you coach and mentor? So that forming teams aspect is a key attribute. The other attribute for us was around distributing work. So we get paid to you know, deliver and support software. So how do the best companies in the world do that? Educate yourself on that um, and then bring those practices and behaviors into the organization. Uh, the third was around measure what matters. Measurement for me, um, what gets measured gets done, but you, you replace a lot of assumptions and opinions with fact, with measures. And once you can measure something, you can then therefore understand root cause and improve upon it. So it becomes this, you know, Agile is about continuous improvement, but the measurement part of Agile really helps you then factually understand where things are broken in order to improve. And that's a, you know, that that's a, um, uh, a big part of that aspect of it as well. The other three we had was attracting people. Um, we wanted leaders to build an environment that, that others wanted to work for them. Uh, but also others wanted to work with the team. So it's an equal contribution between the leader and the team. Um, and so the ability for leaders to attract talent and and take uh, that on to themselves was another big key factor. Uh, the last two attributes are listen, learn, and leverage and impact and influence. So the listen, learn, and leverage is a bit like that before. I mean, we within technology, you're solving problems. Mostly those problems have been solved before. You're not the first one to come across this problem. So people that have a high curiosity and ability to kind of put their ego aside and get out and understand who has solved this before, what is really, what does good look like in the craft that you have, understand how that works and bring that back in and implement it yourself. That The big part of uh, what we wanted our, our culture to be like, and then the impact and influence as an individual you have across your organization. Um, so we we have those six attributes. That's a part of every leader, no matter what role and um, level you're at. Uh, and then we use NPS every quarter to um, measure the success of the leaders and the team, how they're progressing. So we ask two questions. Would you recommend your leader to a colleague or friend or would you recommend your team to a colleague and friend? Uh, and that's a quarterly survey we do. We we The results are very transparent, but it's more that the feedback that it's provided us helps us then formulate plans. And we do that every quarter. And we've been doing that for the last four years. So a long-winded answer, Pete, but there was a number of attributes we used. There were deliberate attributes and we measured 
the success of those attributes for leaders to see where we needed to either can you know start stop and stoke I love how well uh, thought out that is and how well articulated, clearly something that you also carry with you in your mind uh, and easy, have easy recall on. Um, I, I wanted to, uh, you also, in a, in a recent conversation you and I had, ta- you talked about the importance of how you're organized as being a big yeah. influence on culture as well. Can you talk a bit about what you meant by that? Yeah. So part, part of the, like I, I referred to as high-performing team, what does high-performing teams mean? Um a big component of high-performing teams is, is accountability and responsibility. They care for what they do. They take pride in what they do. Uh, and they're looking to build and continue to improve on, on that. And tradition. when I first came here, we were organizing a very traditional IT mode, which was production support and projects. It was very separate. Teams over here only did errors that, you know, occurred in production and support tickets. And team over here only built new stuff. Um I've worked in those environments. It's not a productive environment. There's a lot of finger pointing and this broke over here and this person's fault. Um, And we reorganized ourselves completely into kind of product model, Spotify model. You know, those models are out there. But basically that is, you know, your former cross-functional team around an asset or a product. And they own that asset and product. They own if there's any issues on it. They own all the new development. They own the asset lifecycle, the roadmap, the security, everything about it. So for me, that was the one of the biggest um, step changes in improving the culture was simply reorganizing ourselves into that model because it, it went from one day, I didn't have to get woken up at two o'clock in the morning because my someone else would do that for me to this day. Oh my gosh, I'm now being woken up at two o'clock in the morning for a change I did. And all of a sudden you care a lot more to not be woken up again the next morning. So um that's been a a big factor. We continue to be any any changes organizationally we do, we're guided by those principles um, so that we don't lose the um, you know, the the outcome we're looking for in being organized that way. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I wanted to m- mention also, you you don't have a university degree. I believe you even left high school before finishing. Therefore, uh, you have a, a, a different background educationally on the pathway to becoming a chief information officer, one where so many have technical degrees or engineering degrees of one sort or another. And I wonder, you know, how did you find your way uh, to technology, uh, a field that can at times be very snooty about you know, where, yeah. where, where you, uh, where you've studied and what you've studied. And, and I, I'm also interested in the downstream impact in terms of how you think about people you recruit perhaps a little bit differently based upon your own experience. Talk a bit about that if you would. Yeah, happy to. Yeah. It, it's, um, as you said, I, I never, I never finished high school. Um, and I never went further on to further education. What I did do is, is I went and owned my own business. I, I jumped straight out of school and and for three years, I had my own business. Um, I then transitioned into a few other roles. And, and um, after selling that business, I moved on into other things. And purely by by accident, I landed in IT. And it was, for those who remember Y2K, uh, that was where they were employing anyone who could spell IT. And uh, I was one of those people. So that was my path into IT. It was a, a, a few friends and a cousin of mine recommended me because I was curious about technology um, and particularly coding. Uh, and so I did a number of courses in, in in kind of short coding courses and then drifted into technology. But having been a developer for a number of years, I, I quickly realized I, I like to enjoy what you do. I think, you, you know, life's too short. It's totally up to you. You have a choice to enjoy what you do. And if you don't enjoy it, don't look to other people to solve it for you. It's your choice to act upon that. And I wasn't thoroughly enjoying developing but I also knew I wasn't enjoying because I wasn't terribly good at it. And I realized that coding is difficult. It is an ever evolving uh, craft. There is new tools, there is new um, languages. It, and if you don't have a passion for it to learn all this stuff, you will be left behind. And purely by chance, uh, I got offered a leadership role. And um, uh, my first leadership role, I was was actually a team I used to be a part of. And I was the youngest by 20 years. So I, I moved into a role where I was leading people much more experienced than me, but it was one of my uh, best learning experiences as a leader because I, I I learned that you're not there to teach them new things. They're 20 years my senior. I'm not going to teach them anything they don't know. And so I, I, I learned then to be very authentic. Um, you know, don't try and pull the wool over their eyes. And, and that's kind of stuck with me throughout. So um, what I was very fortunate enough is 
I was in an organization that uh, focused a lot on um, leadership as a craft, not the technology side of things. And so a lot of the people aspects, um, how do you um, build high-performing teams? How do you have effective conversations? We would do role plays a lot. I still do role plays today. I think role plays are a fantastic tool. Um, practice is is the way to improve. Uh, and so that at my younger earlier leadership career really formed and helped me grow and I loved it. And then the other pivotal moment for me was when at, when I got introduced to Agile in, in 2010. It was a very very akin to my personality. Um, you know, it was a, a it's a team based methodology. It's very open, it's very transparent. It's about continually improving. It's short, sharp. It's not long winded. So my short attention span really, uh, <laughs> I grew to like it. So, a couple of key moments really helped me uh, move. And then um, I, I think that I think once anyone you see that kind of really enjoys what they do and then they love what they do. Uh, opportunities come. The other advice I got was never knock an opportunity down. You may not know or see the benefit of this opportunity, but someone is coming to you for something that you, you can't ignore. So I've, I've always taken on opportunities. There's very few I've, I've turned down. Um, and so I've ended up in places that I never, ever thought I would, um, such as Miami, Florida. But um, um, yeah, again, probably a long-winded answer, but uh, it's something that I continue to do. As far as how do I then lead through others and what has that affect me? Again, another uh, mentor of mine said, <laughs> when you're having a, a, a crisis at work, you don't go back and look at the person's resume. You're talking to the person and it's the, the partnership and the relationship you have and how you can work through and solve that problem. As I hire and recruit people, I, I generally look for attitude first, someone who has a very good attitude uh, someone who has a, a high sense of, of self-awareness as well. I think particularly in leaders, if you've got a high level of self-awareness, you do need to know technology. Again, this authenticity part of me, I don't. it's unauthentic to you to ignore technology because you're leading technology people. And how can you lead a group of that if you do not understand it yourself? So you have to have an interest and in an education and passion for it. Um, and so that's how I've kind of gone through. I look for someone who's very people orientated. I look for someone who's got a strong backbone. You need as a, you need to have a, a sense of confidence yourself in what you do, but a strong sense of morals and you know, that self-awareness part that goes with it as well. Yeah, very interesting. I, I, I What a thoughtful answer. I appreciate you, you sharing so many details associated with that, Josh. I wanted to also ask you, as you look to the future, what are some trends that excite you? What, what, what are some uh, you know topics that are beginning to make their way onto your roadmap or or piquing your interest and curiosity, which uh, clearly is one of your big attributes? I w- would love to understand what you're thinking about these days. Yeah, I mean, um, there's a number of those topics. One, one, I mean, and, and in no priority order. But what fascinates me at the moment is the whole low code, no code uh, area. Uh, you know, there's some stat I read that they reckon that. Um, you know, over 60% of application development will be done by low code, no code within five years. So it is a, it's a fast evolving space. Uh, why I think it's highly interesting is I've worked in, in a few organizations from banking, insurance, telecommunications, and now energy. And every one of them, this is the only place I've worked that hasn't had a mainframe. Um, every organization has some form of legacy technology and everyone's trying to modernize that technology. It's difficult, it's hard, and it's expensive. The day that someone comes along with to make that easier is the day that's going to be really fascinating. And then low code, no code is kind of heading towards that, making it a lot easier, not only to produce new new kind of things quick, uh, faster and easier, but to transform existing. So um, again, I have a very similar problem here and it's a space that's really um, high on our to-do list and and why that's important. Uh, the the other is just that whole you know data, but I mean AI data. That that's a very fascinating, fast moving space. Again, it's it's not new; it's been around for a while. But uh, the advancements that we're making is um, is steep. Um, uh, it, it's something we don't do maturely here. But we we do do a little bit of AI, but it's again, it's a space that's um, uh, incredibly fascinating. Yeah, good, good, good topic. Certainly, I look forward to continuing to see how that evolves, and perhaps evolves in an organization like yours. 
I wanted to also ask you a topic you've already begun to allude to in a variety of different ways. And that's sort of like the, the secrets to your success. Uh, a few things I've already begun to hear from you that clearly you've sought mentorship and from the mentors that you've had, you've listened to them, the, just the, the extent to which you've already uh, called uh, recalled several nuggets of wisdom that you clearly have um, firmly in your mind and reflect on uh, in the way that w- which you lead is a is a, a critical aspect, I, it would seem, uh, to to the way in which you lead and the way in which you operate professionally. You also mentioned the importance of saying yes to opportunities, perhaps even if they make you feel a bit uncomfortable as a pathway towards success. What are some other things that come to mind as you think about difference makers along the way for you on your pathway to becoming a chief information officer? Yeah, I, I think the the other one that for me I, I draw upon is you know, I, I own my own business and I, you know, treat it like it's your own money. Um, the resp- if, if anyone's ever owned their own business, the responsibility and accountability that comes with that, it's a 24 by 7, 365 day job. You do not let loose on that. And so uh, there's a certain grit that goes with it and resilience in order to do um, that business well. And so I think that in my younger years, I was kind of 18 to mid 20s is really, um, I've taken that on with me and I think that's one aspect that's really helped me as well. Um, the the other bit for me is just the keeping authentic to me. I think that's the one, no matter what the role, no matter what the situation, um, I don't have to know the answer. I'm not the smartest in the room and don't pretend to be. You're working with a bunch of experts and and uh, make sure you, you know, you lean on them for, for help. So that, that, team-based attitude it's not about me it's about the team and i i keep authentic to that uh uh, because that's kind of you know why i'm here today i think is is a big part of all those reasons i mentioned yeah great great uh, great thoughts all josh well josh mclean thank you so much for joining me today sharing a bit about uh your career pathway a fascinating one indeed uh the transformation you're leading in world fuel services Um, the philosophy that drives you and the cultural elements you're bringing to life within your organization among the many topics that we cover here. I I really greatly appreciate the the great conversation. Yeah, thank you, Pete. And again, I'm privileged to be a part of it and enjoyed the time. Thanks again. Thank you.